Welcome to the Seattle North End Clinic, our virtual clinic. Today, we are going to have Larry Sloan, who's um, a fellow member of the 4D modular group, and he's going to present about um, building turnouts. So as, as many of you probably know, there are four stages of model railroading, right? There's snap track, there's flex track, there's hand laid track, and then there's flex track. Because most of us probably really don't want to build every piece of track that's on our layout or modules. This presentation is, is titled, If and You Gotta, and it's a sage talk about building turnouts or crossings for your model railroad. And I model an HO, uh, in case some of you guys don't know. And I was talking with some friends about making a turnout, as Lisa said, you know, earlier, how long it takes and that I really don't enjoy that process very much, but it seems to be something that is my best option right now. So anyway, so somebody asked, why build your own turnouts? Yeah. So building or buying. So the benefits of buying, of course, is you probably won't drive yourself crazy and it's faster, right? Assuming the turnouts you need are available. And, you know, I've had lots of experience with commercial turnouts. These are, this is just a picture of a pile of turnouts I happen to have from my old layout that never got ballasted because I ended up tearing down the layout. So first off, I started off with uh, Atlas. You know, that's a popular option in the hobby. And they have these kind of big um, <clears throat> hinges on there. And they have the frog as sort of a, a soft metal piece it's called some people call it white white metal some people call it pot metal but you know when i was first in the hobby i thought well that's okay but later on i kind of thought nah, eh, you know as as i got along it really doesn't look that good and then i had some experience with shinohara and i actually like the shinohara turnouts quite a bit but as many as many of you probably know they sold their business to walters and walters is in the process of like redoing uh relaunching the line and i don't know what all they're doing maybe they're retooling all this stuff but they kept pushing back the dates of which the stuff was going to be available and it really doesn't fit the profile well along with the pico track that i like to use and then there's pico turnouts and i like the way they make their turnouts except for that little spring that's in the throw bar um, I really don't like that. I end up removing it every time I use a Pico turnout. And um, they're in the process of revamping their turnout line, in case you didn't know. Uh, right now, they're, they're getting rid of the electro frog versus the insul frog. And now they're just having a unifrog. So a lot of their turnouts right now, unless you want the old ones, aren't really available either. When I looked at the possibilities of what I needed to do with my layout, I decided I was thinking more about building my own turnouts. And if you need a lot of turnouts, you can actually save yourself a little bit of money um, by building your own turnouts. If you're trying to create a yard ladder like I was, and you're trying to make the yard ladder you know, a specific kind of depth, well, if you buy a commercial turnout, a lot of times you have to cut the turnout or you have to put little extent pieces of track between the track to you know to lengthen out the turnouts and i thought well i don't really like the the idea of doing either one of those things so um, for ultimate control over the design and the quality of the turnouts i decided to go ahead and just build my own um, for this particular thing i've also been building turnouts for uh, the, the Tacoma Northwestern and now fourth division Fremo group um, layout or, or modules as well. So I have a bit of experience building turnouts. And you know, some people, not me, but some people actually enjoy building turnouts. I don't really enjoy it that much myself, but it's kind of the best solution for me right now. This is a drawing of, uh, of the west end of the yard on my layout. 
Um, as you can see, there's a lot of turnouts there. Uh, the kind of in the center is the West End ladder. And then <clears throat> to the left of that, as I'm looking at it anyway, will be the tracks that lead to like the turntable and the, the uh, engine shop and so on and so forth. And down on the bottom is a crossover that's on the main line. So that's just kind of an end-to-end -end shot of where my uh, yard is right now. Not much in the way of turnouts there. If you're going to build your turnouts, um, some people just use the NMRA gauge and uh, they lay out where they want their turnout to be and they go to town. Um, I suggest even if you're going to use a fast tracks jig or whatever method you're using, use the NMRA gauge religiously so that you can make sure that the frog and all that is in the right place. Because if it, if it slips like it has on me from time to time, you end up with a turnout where the real where the wheels will derail at the frog. And that's, you know, that's no fun because then you got to take it up and fix it. And while you might test it on the bench, there's just no substitute for that uh, for that gauge. This is the this is a downloaded template of a fast tracks crossing. But I don't have a picture of the crossing that I actually built for my NMRA certification. I don't have a jig for this, and I didn't have the tools for this. So I just I took the pieces of rail and I literally filed them down till I got them to the best angles for where they needed to be after I printed this out, slapped it down on a piece of wood, and tried to you know get things in place as best as I could and I swear it took me like three weeks to build this crossing it was it was a really long and arduous process but it does work um, it passed the test and uh, I got my certificates so thanks to Ed Lee Say and uh, Jack Hamilton and, and Walt uh, for uh, participating in that uh, in that adventure and luckily we got that that to end just before quarantine hit last year so it was the last Tacoma clinic that, that we had before things went got locked down this is a fast tracks jig and um <clears throat> the reason I'm showing you this picture up close well there's a couple of reasons one is to show you what it looks like in case you've never seen one but uh on top of that on the jig that I'm using, this is a this is one that belonged to the TNW for building a number six HO scale uh, turnout. There's little marks on here. If you can see them, kind of in the center of a lot of the a lot of the PC ties that you see here, and those marks are there to make it easier for me to mark where I need to gap those PC ties. Um, on the templates that you can download from Fast Tracks it shows you where to do that. And, but rather than pulling out the template and looking at it every single time, I just put some little dots, pin marks on top of the jig so I could just mark it directly on the PC ties. This is a stock aid tool, and it is not something that Fast Track sells as part of their recommended kit. Um, so you have to kind of, you have to look to actually buy it separately if you're gonna do this. And so it's an it's kind of an optional thing, and that's why they don't sell it as their as part of their kit. Is <clears throat> what it does is it holds a piece of rail in place so you can file it easier. Um, and you can do without doing this. You can actually buy one of those. Uh, you can buy a sanding or a um, a bench sander, and I'll show you a picture of one of those in case you don't know what it looks like. Um, that you can do this with. So you don't necessarily have to buy this tool. But if you're going to do hand filing, you almost got to have one of those. This is a flat file. Um, they also call these a mill file or my favorite, the bastard file. Why they call it a bastard file, I don't know, but maybe it was because they needed to laugh at something. This is the belt sander I was talking about. Um, I don't usually buy tools from uh, from Harbor Freight Tools. Honestly, I don't find they're very good. 
but um, they were actually the only ones that had this thing uh, available at the time. And it's not a it's not a bad little tool. It was like ninety nine bucks, and um, but it doesn't come with the proper sanding belt for doing metal. So I had to go over to McClendon's and actually buy a separate belt to put on there. And uh, I've done a number of turnouts with this thing. I've only done I've I've never gotten to the point where I wore out the first belt yet. So the, the belts last a long time. This is a point form tool. And if you're going to do any kind of track work where you're going to be making points or frogs or anything like that, or if you're going to do a crossing, I, I really recommend you get one of these. This is also the point where, uh, get pardon the pun, and where I will say that it's been in the email. So some of you might have already seen this, but I'm kind of the track librarian for that, or the, the librarian for the, um, the fast tracks tools that the 4D has now. So if any of you um, want to try building a turnout and you don't want to go through and buy like all of this stuff, um, get a hold of me. And uh, you know, Russ has got my number, but I also put it on the Grab Iron Post as well. It's out there uh, and my email address. And uh, we'll arrange to, uh, to meet up so you can borrow these tools and, and check them out. Um, <clears throat> I'm hoping at some point we can actually add to that library because right now we've got like four jigs and a few of the point form tools. But the point form tools are really the most critical thing if you're going to do this kind of stuff because that makes making the proper angle for the frogs and for the points one heck of a lot easier than say my crossing where I you know, hand filed all of that stuff. It's pretty ridiculous how long it took. One of the things that was one of the most nerve wracking things for me about building turnouts was when I spent all this time building the turnout, you know, like an hour and a half into the turnout, building this thing. And uh, then I got to take my jeweler saw and gap it. So there you see my jeweler saw where I've, you know, weaved or threaded the, uh, the blade through and then clamped it back into the jeweler saw so I could sit there and, and cut that turnout. Um, I found that my big old vice is the easiest way of doing this. It holds it the most securely of anything that I've tried so far. Um, and then I take my, one of my hands and hold on to the turnout while I'm doing it as well. And uh, since I've been doing this and I've made some other changes, I haven't broken a turnout once because the first probably two turnouts that I built, if not the third, if not three, um, at this point when I was cutting these gaps, I broke the turnout. So I, then I had to go back and fix it, which because you're building your own turnout, one of the advantages of that is of course, you can fix it because most commercial turnouts, once they're broken, that's pretty much it. They're broken, but your own turnout, you can you can do it. It's not always easy, but you can. After I'm done soldering and cutting the turnout, um, I go through and clean it with isopropyl alcohol and a glue brush. And these glue brushes you can probably buy in a lot of different places. I happened to pick up this pack at Napa a few years ago, and it was like 30 brushes or something like that. So I've never, never gotten to the point where I've run out. So when it comes to putting the turnouts on the layout, Fast Tracks recommends Pliobond. It's this really smelly, noxious glue, in my opinion, that doesn't seem to work all that well unless you heat it up. And I find you can overheat it and then it doesn't work well either. So I've gotten to the point where I don't actually use Pliobond anymore. I went ahead and bought the HO scale fast track spikes, which are actually the micro engineering spikes. Um, and I drill the, uh, the ties with my pin vise and I insert the spike into there. And uh, I just spike the turnout down. I don't use the Pliobond at, at all. And uh, I think it works pretty well. You're, what you're looking at in the left picture there is, of course, a 
raw turnout where I've used the, um, the PC ties, of course, and uh, you can see the gaps in the PC ties. And you can also see um, the what they call what fast track calls a quick stick, which is a <clears throat> laser cut piece of, of wood that is built specifically for these turnouts. Um, <clears throat> the upside of it is, is that it is really quick and it's and they're pretty nice. The downside of it is, is if you're going to build a crossover or something a little more special, you can end up kind of tossing aside a chunk of the quick stick because it's too big. I'm going to give you some examples of different things people have done. My friend Brian Pickering, who's also with the Fourth Division HO modular group, uh, hand laid this turnout without any jigs, but he did use Fast Track's point form tools. Um, and what he did here was <clears throat> he printed out the template. He actually like glued the template down to the base of his module, and then he spiked. As you, if you look really close, you can see he spiked each individual tie because he didn't want to deal with using the PC board ties. He didn't want that look in the middle of his track. So he went and he just spiked everything by hand with individual spikes. It took him a long time to do, according to, that's what he told me. I don't know how long it took, but it was a really long time. Okay. Some other examples the guys provided me. I'm on a Facebook group that's called Track Modeling and Detailing. And believe it or not, this is a Facebook group that, that is focused only on that. They don't talk about engines, cars, anything else. It's all about the track 24-7. Uh, this guy um, is on the East Coast. Um, and he's modeling a uh, railroad that's in the United in the United Kingdom, and these are exacto scale parts, and that's why the ties, uh, the um, brackets that are holding the ties, that's why they look like that. It looks pretty cool. It's not something I would do because it doesn't follow any of my prototype stuff, um, but that's what he does with his stuff. <clears throat> this was made by a guy by the name of Stephen Buck, who's actually in Australia. And he's modeling like 1920s Sydney. And so this is a double switch, double, double slip switch that he constructed out of fast tracks and Proto 87 materials. So if when you're looking at this picture, you'll see. I mean, it, it doesn't look very good like this, honestly, but when you get when you get to his later pictures and stuff, it looks pretty cool. Um, if you look just to the left and right of center of the turnout, you'll see some what looks like some flat pieces in there. And those are some hinges for that turnout. This is also Stephen Buck's stuff. This is his fiddle yard. Um, and he gave me, he, he sent me a picture of the yard in its completed state, which I wanted to show you, but unfortunately the one that he sent me was really low resolution. So it didn't look good at all, but this is, this is what his plan for his fiddle yard was. And all of those ties in there are PC board ties. He's gone through and, and he's done a heck of a lot of work on that, as you can see. This is one of my ties that it has been done. Um, and this one was painted with uh, airbrushed um, with uh, Vallejo uh, mahogany um, just a you know a few days ago, and so this is this was done with the fast tracks jig, and um, you know you can see you can still kind of see the PC ties in there, but once you get it painted, it really doesn't show up very well. So you can you won't most people won't notice that there's PC ties in there. This was done by Steve, Go Steve Cox. This is on his, uh, uh, his SN3 layout. And this is a dual gauge turnout that he hand laid. Um, those, uh, those ties are all wood. Um, 
that's all stuff he he um i was there when he was like dipping all of his ties in his uh, alcohol and in the ink and i can't remember what the other color is in the solution but he you know tinted all of his ties before he put them down and now he's got standard on the right you know standard or on the left excuse me standard s and on the right there sn3 um, for that narrow for that dual gauge turnout so pretty cool stuff not my cup of tea but i think it looks good this was done by tim runs down in uh, um, california ocean something not oceanside oceano that's it oceano california this is a module a fremo module that he's built using the proto 87 stuff uh, on the left there and on the upper right is a close-up shot of some of his track work on the lower left is a shot he sent me of him putting together some of the stuff in his in the fat in the um the proto 87 jig which is stainless steel and you can get these magnets for it so that it holds the track in place because he doesn't spike it more on that in a minute so he told me that he doesn't he used to like to watch use the walters uh spikes but walters doesn't make those spikes anymore so he can't get them he's completely out of them so he uses a, a JB Weld 15 minute epoxy um, and glues down his rail. Uh, he does use some ultra or what do you say, micro mini spikes from micro engineering when he needs to really spike something. Uh, he'll use those. And those are the spikes that you actually see in this picture. Um, the ties are, are part of the um, the Proto 87 stuff. And so are the tie plates that you see in there and the joint bars and all of that, you know, all that stuff you see in that picture. Um, it looks like a lot of detail work to me, but uh, you can see the results are, are pretty cool. And if it's something you can see, like right up next to the edge of your layout or on a module, I can totally see how something like this would be a really cool thing to have. This is another shot of Tim's stuff. Just the uh, um, the Proto 87 plastic ties, what they call their fast and easy, as I understand it, uh, stuff. And um, they also, what do you say? He said they etched the nickel silver frog um and some hinges and things like that and then there's joint bars that they make and you know other other stuff like that that just looks pretty darn cool like i said i think it would probably actually take me even longer to build a turnout with this stuff but you know i guess i'd find out one of these days because i'm curious enough that i'll probably buy it when i get a chance and that my friends is the uh last page on the presentation whichever way you decide to go in building your turnouts, my suggestion is take your time, use the gauge, uh, you know, religiously, because you don't want it to end up, you know, looking like that car on the right. So um, that's the end of my presentation. You guys uh, have any questions? This is Ted Becker. Um, could I? Could I make a couple of comments? Sure, absolutely. Um, one one thing is is uh, for me was cost because uh, commercial turnouts are costing like twenty twenty five dollars. Once you buy the jigs, uh, you can build another fast tracks turnout for just a few dollars. It's it's about uh, my la at my last calculation, Ted. It was about uh, eleven dollars. Uh, for an HO scale number six for me to build one. Um, that's about how much it costs per turnout for me to build one, I think it was. Yeah, I think my cost, my, my figures were somewhat less than that, but I buy, I use Clover House uh, PC ties and I cut my own wooden ties out of uh, uh, Fast Tracks or uh, uh, um, Mount Albert, a uh, bulk track material, or, bulk tie material 
So that reduced the cost a bit. But the other thing is, is um, can I share screen? Sure, I can stop sharing here. Hang on a second. This is a double slip switch that I built using the fourth division fast tracks jigs that you can now borrow. One thing I did different on this is um, prototype double slips have in the middle here, they have movable points. Whereas the, the jig is designed for fixed points and most commercial uh, scale turnouts are have fixed points there. Um, anyway, anyhow, I did this modification and made it made it movable points and uh, uh, it was a real challenge, but uh, it the trucks roll through it nice and smooth. The drawback is to properly operate them without a lot of extra linkages. It takes four ground throws and quite a bit of thinking to uh, how to route through the through the double slip, but uh, this will eventually be automated with uh, servos. So I won't have to worry about it. Anyhow, that's uh, what I wanted to say. Okay, I was gonna uh, mention for that uh, double slip switch with the movable, uh, with, with yes. all four sets of movable points. That's actually a, probably a good opportunity to, if you're gonna automate those, to use something like LCC. You can program all four, all four sets to move appropriately at the same time. Uh, I'll be using Arduino with servos. Okay. So Larry, this is Byron for our Fremos for our club. I built 40 of those turnouts, number six, half about half number six and half number eight. And you still have your hair. Well, yeah, so in some places anyway. <laughs> and I used the fourth division's uh, jigs and tools to build those with. I was able to borrow them from Russ, well, I don't know, probably three, four years ago. And it worked really well. Yep. Well, now, like I said before, I actually have them at my house, and since I'm, since I'm, I'm in Kent, right? So I'm kind of, I guess you could say, somewhat central to the fourth division. So I felt like that would make it, if they were here, that it would make it a little bit easier for people to, to come by, you know, and and uh, you know, pick up and drop off. So. Yeah. What a one of the tricks I found when you're built, if you got a lot to build is build them in an assembly, uh, well, assembly line, build all the points, make all the pro the closure rails, build in groups, then start assembling the whole item. It, it made it much faster. I got down to doing them uh, about an hour per turnout by doing them that way. Okay. I'm probably still at best. I'm probably still on a fast one. I'm probably still at an hour and a half. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's it, for what it is. I mean, it's a lot of money to buy turnouts, but, um, you know, it's, it's also a lot of time to sit there and, and do all that work too. So it's, uh, you know, it's an interesting trade-off, but for my yard, um, I wanted to have the tracks a certain amount of space apart. And I just found that that the turnouts, the commercial ones, most of them were too long, or you know, there was one or two that were just too short. So for me, it was like, well, if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna do all this, I could save about probably about ten or fifteen dollars a turnout by building them myself. But that wasn't my primary objective. My primary objective was to have the yard laid out the way I wanted it to, and with a, with also, <clears throat> kind of one A, if you will, the. Uh, the ability to have it be uh, the quality that I wanted, right? The turnouts to be built the way I wanted it to be built, and so, you know, and having run on the Boeing modules, I know I can tell I can tell everybody that Byron did a pretty doggone good job on those turnouts. They uh, they were they work really well. Uh, I would I would like to second your comment about um, preferring to fast tracks uh, turnouts for cutting and flitting, fitting in tight tight locations because uh, you do that, at least I do it before I put the ties on. And um, and it's a lot easier than to figure out where you want ties that will span a couple of tracks and when you want to interleave the ties and it makes that 
that makes it a lot, lot neater and easier to do in my, in my book. This is Lee. One of the things that is attractive to it to me, and I've built a layouts behind me here, and I've got a bunch of Shinohara, Walter's Shinohara turnouts. And I've noticed that the curve turnouts tend to drift wide and get out of gauge. And as I started to try to run proto scale wheel sets, I found that all of a sudden uh, I was having derailment problems. And to correct that, I've gone back to the wide wheels. But um, you know, doing it again, I'd probably um, use the fast track, mod, um, you know, jigs to build things. It's uh, it's been a little bit frustrating, but um, I, you know, you learn as you go. But yeah, I think the quality you get probably from the fast tracks approach is better, even though it takes you some time to build them and you save some money. This is the west end of my uh, of my Elma yard as it currently exists, um, and so you guys can see all these turnouts right in the middle are all number sixes, um, and I use uh, Eileen's tacky glue. And I just glue down. What I do is I'll take the um, the quick sticks, and I'll actually take them off. Well, the sprue, I guess you could call it, and you know, sand off the uh, splinters that are on there a little bit. And then, uh, kind of like Ted and I were talking about a few minutes ago, there, I'll figure out exactly how far I want to take the the uh, the quick sticks, if not all the way. And um, I glue them down to the base uh, with using the turnout itself as a guide to where I want them to go. Uh, and the fast, the um, Eileen's, I can actually move the move them around for a little bit, you know, for a couple of minutes before that glue sets. But once that glue sets up, they're not going anywhere. And then when I'm done with that, then I take the fast track spikes. And I use my pen vise, probably a number 80, I think it is. I was going to write this down, Doug, and I forgot. Um, a number 80, and I drill uh, into the, uh, the wood ties with that. And then I push the spike in there. Because I found that if you don't drill the ties first, that the fast track spikes will just bend on you. And that's, you know, or they'll bend when you try to put it in the plywood. And that's, that's really annoying. So um, I drill those out. Also, um, hand, hand laid turnouts have a stronger, it takes more to push the point. So if you're using tortoises, that little, I think it's like 025 or 020 piece of piano wire that comes with the tortoise won't uh, actually move the points. You have to, um, or I've had to uh, get some thicker piano wire, either a 032 or an 037, depending on the turnout, um, and drill out the tortoise a little bit uh, using my pin vise to um, to let that bigger bar or let that bigger throw bar fit uh, in there, that big wire fit in there. So, and that works. That seems to be working pretty well. So, I'm pretty happy with the results on that. I've only had to do a couple of turnouts where they got a little stiff and I had to do a, you know, a bigger, a bigger bar. This is, you know, this is just underneath that uh, same end of the, uh, of the mod or the layout there, I almost said module. Um, and this is before I did all the wiring, but essentially, yeah, I just take that little wire that the, that the fast track or that the tortoise comes with and chuck it. And then, like I said, drill it out. So there you go. I've used a lot of heavier um, wires with my tortoises, some of which are further down than you than just being on the bottom of the plywood. It makes yep. a huge difference. And there's uh, all eventually you can figure out all kinds of schemes to make that work. Where I've run into tortoises that lined up on joist under my layout after I built it and could build some remote devices using that heavier wire. It works well. Yeah, I need to work on a re one remote device. Um, one of my uh, turnouts is going to be kind of back farther. 
and it ended up being right up against a brace. And I bought one of the tortoise offset kits, but it's missing a part. <laughs> I went to put it in the other day and I was like, oh man, really? Anyway, so this is the ugly duckling. So you guys can see that. It's going to take a second to snap into focus. But this was my hand-built crossing. And this was a piece of plywood that I attached it down to so I could haul it down to Tacoma and take it to the clinic there in January of last year so that it could get judged. You know, these, uh, these soldering joints on here, I probably redid most of those about six or seven times before I got this thing right. So it, by the time I was done with it, I was... I was really done with it, <laughs> but it does work. As we all know who have hand-built turnouts, the moment you paint that and weather it and ballast it, put the ties in, it's gonna blend in beautifully. You can quit complaining about how it looks, only how it works. Right. So yep. as long as it works, you'll be happy with it. There's a couple things to see here. Um, at the bottom is a crossover that I built um, and I have it taped together because I'm ready to start uh, putting the ties under. And above it is a, an assembly that I made. It's a, uh, on the left is uh, a number five Y from the uh, um, 4D jigs. And then to the right of that is a number eight, a regular turnout that was also built with the 4D jigs. But the interesting thing about this, about this is the stock rail for both turnouts all the way through is one piece. And the actual points are only about um, an inch or so apart. And I don't have the throw bars installed yet. But the other thing is above it is my compartmented tie box. I, I mentioned I cut my own ties with my Northwest short line chopper. And um, I cut them to length, stain them, and then put them in these compartments uh, that are labeled by length. So when I'm ready to put the, uh, the ties on the turnout, I just pick out what I need. I'm trying to remember, yeah, I think I built this crossover so that the frog, the frog rail and the stock rail for the other turnout is one piece. On yeah, both we'll, sides. And yeah, that's, we'll, that's a real trick. <laughs> yeah, it is. Once you've built a few of those turnouts, I think you start to get an idea of how you could actually make that work. Yeah. Um, and I've, I've kind of, I haven't actually done that yet, but I've got, I've actually thought about doing that a time or two. I just haven't, I haven't, uh, haven't done it yet. So. Yeah, the real secret to it is is use the paper templates. Yeah. Cut them and fit them and get them lined up and then you can see um what your possibilities are for building like these with the one piece of rail yeah another thing that i wanted to say was is that if if any of you guys out there are like you think you might want to build one or two turnouts and just try it out the part of the i think part of the intimidating thing right now is when i went to buy when i went to do all this um i had to order from far off far away, you know, and I had to pay some pretty significant shipping and wait some pretty significant amount of time to get all the materials that I needed. Um, because the, um, I checked around a few weeks ago and nobody in the area had the materials that I was looking for to, to build turnouts. Right. Yeah. And, um, I wanted to say that I'm willing to, sell something like if you need a stick or two a rail right i can work with you on that stuff so you don't have to buy a big pile of stuff right because most guys want to build like uh like lee was talking about you know getting a certificate you know you want to build one or two turnouts to do that you don't want you don't need this big huge pile of supplies all sitting around in case you decide you don't want to do that anymore right? If that's fine, if you decide you want to do it, and you're going to buy all that stuff. But one of the great things about the fourth division having some jigs is that you can try it without spending all that extra money. I think that's fantastic. 
Hey, Larry, one caution on those jigs. It yeah. has to be micro engineering rail. Yes. Code 83, you can't use any other brand. It will not fit. That's a good point, Byron. The the uh, Atlas rail um, won't work. Well, it's really yeah. good to know that you can only do this with micro engineering rail. Because uh, I was thinking about trying a different type. So if, if you're going to well, handle it, Lee, if you're just going to do it without a jig, you can use whatever rail you want. But uh, the fast tracks tools are built with microengineering rail in mind. Okay, good to know. Is that the way I want to go? The 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 um, the guide point or whatever the positioning of the rail is based on the width of the base. Mm. It's the width of the base that determines gauge and stuff. So, um, so that other brands of rail may not work. They won't well, even they won't even fit in the jig itself. No, because it's wider. <laughs> yeah, and I I, felt, I had that problem when I tried um, the uh, Central Valley uh, kits with uh, Atlas Rail, and it just didn't work out. I, I'd like to another tip on the uh, number eight jig that. Um, the uh, stock rail, there's a very long stretch, uh, two or three inches or so, where the rail is only supported or positioned on one side, and that rail can bow in, particularly on the curved part. It can curve in a little too much, and the gauge yeah. can be narrow. So you have to be sure that the base of the rail is pushed out against yeah. the jig. He's Number talking six is... He's talking about right here. Right there, on, yes, exactly. See that on the jig. No, on the yeah. number six, um, right it's not, it's not a problem. I've got number six I'm building right here on my bench right now, with my own uh, number six jig. Thank you all for coming. It's always nice. I, we have someone I, from BC. We have a couple of Canadian folks. I see someone from Alaska. Um, this is just really, really nice that we can um, have these and with so many people from all over the country and and um, and such. So it was lovely seeing everybody. Thank you, Larry, 